Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Uh, some of you may remember that we uh, had been studying in 2 Corinthians. Uh, we were in chapter 5. An amazing passage of scripture because as we came out of the teaching concerning the, the church there at Corinth being carnal and fleshly, you know, we've gone through uh, a series of revelations from God concerning uh, how that that situation had changed. And uh, there's about three or four chapters, four, maybe even five chapters here uh, in the uh, study in which we're, we're at and where we're at right now that that really speak of it's drawing a contrast between a walk uh, in the flesh and a walk in the spirit. Uh, in verse 10 of chapter 5, we, if you remember, we were reading that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That is a, a statement, I believe, that uh, the Holy Spirit, in conveying that thought to us here, is reminding us of the fact that we there is something to how we walk. It's not just that, you know, well, there's, you know, there's rewards to be uh, looked at here. There's no judgment, but this is in the context of how we walk. We will all, without exception, every one of us, appear before the judgment seat of Christ, where that our work, our entire life's work, uh, which hopefully was built on that one foundation Christ is not something other than that which we built and uh, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to uh, that which he's done whether it be good or bad and that brought us to I believe verse 11 of chapter 5 which is kind of where we left off uh, verse 11 knowing knowing therefore the terror of the Lord we and we'll stop right there and uh, make sure in our minds that what we are reading we understand we don't fear God uh, the word terror there is reverence in fact the word means a deep reverence of God and so looking at that verse in context verse 11 knowing therefore the abject, deep, deep heart, hearted, deep seated reverence, overabundance of reverence that we have for God, we persuade men. It's a, an amazing little verse. What I basically am going to suggest that this verse, what I think it's saying, is, is that if we do not have that deep reverence for what Christ did, his work, his person, his work, if that's not who we preach, because we preach nothing but Christ and him crucified, then we're not going to persuade anyone of anything. The only persuasion that we see here is in the context of our ministry, which we've previously read was we've been given a ministry of liberty. And that's what we preach. So therefore, or knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And we are made manifest unto God. It's just a beautiful, beautiful statement. Paul goes on to say, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. I've known a number of people in my life since I became a Christian. I've met a lot of Christians. I've interacted with a lot of Christians. I've talked with a lot of Christians. I've preached to a lot of Christians. I've, I've received preaching from a lot of Christians. I've read a lot of articles. I've read a lot of books. I've, as most Christians have, I've dabbled in just about everything that I could get my, my hands on as far as, as trying to better understand my relationship with God and, and my walk in Him. And in all that time, what I have not seen is something contrary to what the chapter as well as the book is, has taught us. 
and that is that many will not hear. The majority will not hear. They can't hear. It's not that, well, they could if somehow we could, you know, uh, corrupt the, the Word of God, uh, 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 is if we could just use deceit, tactics of deceit and deception and, and sort of manipulate the data, manipulate the numbers, you know, preach something other than the truth. And dearly beloved, what our context is clearly pointing out to us is that we will all appear, be stand before God and give an account on how we built on Christ. Paul is writing to the Corinthians and he's telling them that he hopes that in the exact words that he uses here are that we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God. And I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. I don't think we need to over complicate this sentence. I think basically what he's saying is that there will be those who hear us. There will be those who, there were those in the, in, during Paul's time in which they were, they, they were made manifest in their consciences. For we commend, and that's verse 12, we commend not ourselves again unto you. I have a group of followers that, that not only have, I, I, I believe, and it's a small group, but over a period of time, in, in, in the course of my ministry, and the walk, my walk with the Lord, and that walk of, of freedom and grace, and the ministry, and, and preaching Christ, and nothing but Him crucified, and preaching the finished work of Christ, and how it, His work was sufficient. We don't need to add anything to it. In all of that time, I personally can say, and I think you probably could too, I, I think you should be able to say, that there have been individuals that God brought into your life which in which they were made manifest. You were made, what you taught them was made manifest in their conscience. It was made clear in their conscience that what you were teaching was the truth. There's many who, who don't or will not, but there, there will be some who do. And when it comes to those that I've known and I do know personally in my life, I can name a few names. We have a small group on, on, uh, on Facebook, and uh, it's we're just a sort of small, tiny little fraction of a family that, that really loves the Lord. Look, is really looking forward to His return, and we love studying His Word together, and we help one another. We pray for one another. We we genuinely love one another, and uh, you, you who are members of that group, you know who you are. I don't think that there's the text is telling me that there's any reason for me to think that I need to commend myself and what I teach again to you. But it does give you occasion to glory on our behalf, Paul says. And and I think that's beautiful. That ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. Dearly beloved, the Word of God has so much to say about a faith versus a sight walk and, and looking outwardly, uh, trying to judge our position in Him by our condition, trying to evaluate, you know, our, or substantiate or confirm our relationship with Him or our position in Him by looking at outward circumstances and not just outward, you know, in the sense of looking outward at others, but, but inward at ourselves, walking by, by sight, not by faith. It, we're commanded not to do that. Ask yourself this, why would God command us not to look outwardly at our circumstances, our difficulties, our trials, our hardships, our relationships, our everything about our life, our work, our ministry. Why would God want us to look at all of that and evaluate or estimate our worthy worthiness to Him based upon our performance? Well, you know, I'm really doing well, and so you know, I'm look I'm looking at, at all these things that I can see, 
you know, through my eyes around me that's going on, things that I can actually see and touch. And, and so surely, based upon that, on, on, upon what I see, God must be working. He must be blessing me. He must be, you know, I must be doing right. I, it, everything must be. And then when everything falls apart, because it will, it will. And you're not, you're no longer walking upright, walking circumspectly or however that you use that term. You know, well, I'm looking around and I'm not seeing God do it. God doesn't appear to be working, doesn't seem to be doing anything. So things must just not be right. There must be something wrong. Why would God command us not to, to walk by faith, not by sight, to trust him in his promises and what he says and not look outwardly or inwardly at ourselves and, and, and basically judge, pass judgment on our performance and how we sort of, you know, uh, you know, I don't, you know, we, uh, I, I wish I could, I wish there was a better phrase that I could use. I, I you know, I don't, I don't, I kind of didn't want to say, you know, we just don't match up. We just, we don't, we don't fit. It, nothing fits. I don't, it doesn't seem, there's got to be something wrong because I'm not seeing it. Because God is not blessing me. Something must be wrong. You know, I'm, uh, he just keeps bringing trials and hardships in, into my life. And, and, and dearly beloved, I'll tell you like I've told so many others. You know, I, I, would, I would do anything to help ease your burdens, ease your trials, to make your walk through the desert a little more pleasant. Okay? Surround you, you know, by flowers and, and candy and whatever, whatever I could do. I could, if I had the ability to take and relieve you of all your suffering. And your pain and your trial. If if it was in my power, if I if I could do that, I would. I would, and I'd probably screw up your life, folks. God has the ability to, to do that, and He doesn't. We are to count it all joy when we face various trials, knowing that the suffering that that what we're going through is going to produce results beyond anything that we could possibly imagine. But we, it's hard, and it's difficult, and I understand that. It's, I, I myself, I'm no different than you all, you folks. I'm not, I'm, not some, I'm not anything different than you. You know, I know what it's like to, to go through grievous trials. And, but, but it's an opportunity to look to Him, to praise Him for everything He is, who He is, all He is in our lives. We only got one shot at that. Just knowing that he will never cease to sustain and uphold us, knowing that after he's tested us, we shall come forth as gold. This is what he has said. You know, one of the major problems of Christians' defeat today is a lack of understanding, a lack of knowledge, a lack of, of realization of who they are in Christ, really who God did is and what he did, and who they are, and how that, that, that relationship is sustained folks left with to our own devices none of us would not not only would we make it to glory we we wouldn't really accomplish anything worthwhile in this life there are those who glory they boast the word is boast in appearance and not in heart or whether we are beside ourselves, that's, that's, and I, I looked at behind this, the curtain here at the original language here. It's clear, it's clear to me that what he's saying when he says, for whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. This is the Holy Spirit telling us, quite simply, I think, this, this is just my opinion, that I'm going to appear insane to some of you and I'm going to appear rational to, to others. Sober. I'm going to appear sensible, sober, right? And to others, I'm just going to be appear just, I don't know, they're going to think I'm Looney Tunes.
For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. Whether it's one or the other, it's for your cause. Verse 14, for the, I love this verse. It's been a special verse of mine my whole life. For the love of Christ constrains us. And that has nothing to do with performing some exorcism. The love of Christ. There's been more folks done in the name of Christ, done for God, for Christ, under grace and love. If, if the reason, if your motive for doing something, anything for God, if your motive is not one that's out of pure love, just because you love him, you know, I, I'm going to the mission field to save souls. Now, don't go to the mission field to save souls. Go to the mission field because you love him, because you may not save souls. Well, I go to church every Sunday. I go to church. I don't miss a Sunday. I don't miss a step. I even go on Wednesday. I never miss church, you say. I, I couldn't begin to number, and this is just, I, and there's no way of even, even estimating this. I, I don't know how many Christians are pro probably sit in church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday who, who glory in appearance, not in heart. The whole reason that the text is telling us that Christ died for us. And this, this is a judgment that we need to make, verse 14, okay? Because we thus judge, we thus have concluded, the word is, we've, con we've made the conclusion, we've come to the conclusion that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves but unto him which died for them and rose again and depending on how you look at that verse i can easily see how that the the fleshly carnal law keeping self-righteous pharisaical you know believer you know one who who's walking according to the flesh walking according to law not grace who doesn't understand the difference between a flesh walk a walk in the spirit and a, and a walk in the flesh I can easily see how they would they would interpret that. You know, they approach that verse with their own preconceived idea that really, really what that means is it's saying that, okay, he died for all of us, every man, every man. He died for us all. This is the, listen, folks, first of all, when we're studying, don't abandon the context, don't abandon the audience in which the epistle is being written to. The Holy Spirit, through Paul, is writing to Christians when he says all. Okay? It's in the context of those at Corinth. It's all of, the, all of them at Corinth. Don't make it out to be something that it's not. Christ did not die in the place of all men. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. He did not die in the place of Esau. Now, you may want him, you may, you may think that, well, it would have been great if he had, and then Esau would have had a choice whether or not accept Christ or not. Folks, that is not how this works. Yes, we are a channel that preaches at, with absolute, with, without apology, the absolute sovereignty of God, the election of the, the divine election of the believer, chosen in him before the foundation of the world, but, but this is not a channel in which we throw away responsibility or obligation and say, well, okay, Christ has done everything. We don't have to do anything at all. Just sit back, you know, enjoy the ride. You're going to heaven. Why worry about rewards? Why worry about anything? Folks, we have an obligation. We have a debt. And that debt, that obligation that we have, is not to make ourselves righteous, make ourselves more acceptable to God, our debt, our obligation to God is, is one of grace. We are obligated not to live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That is our obligation. We present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which the text says is our reasonable service. Well, good Lord, no wonder it's reasonable. 
God doesn't consider it outlandish, out extreme. It's not, he's not saying this is something that's just way out there beyond your, you know, no, this, it's your reasonable service to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Why? Because you are, you do stand before him, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. You always have. More Christians have been ruined by the carnality that we read through through both epistles in, in, the, in, in the book, the two letters to the Corinthians, as well as others. There's Galatians, Galatian, the Galatian error. You know, the, the entire epistle of Galatians was written to address the very legal legalistic problem there at Galatia, which permeates, basically dominates modern evangelism and Christianity today. Folks, nothing new under the sun. We are Christians. We've been made new creations in Christ Jesus. We don't live henceforth unto ourselves. We don't live under ourselves. Now, now you can look at that and you can say, well, that's a statement that, that you know, that I'm reading this by the Holy Spirit through Paul. Okay, we don't, we henceforth, we don't live unto ourselves. So what, what that means is, is basically we just got to, you know, this, the ideal here, the Holy Spirit's presenting this really pretty picture, this pretty ideal of, of how that we just, don't live unto our, ourselves and what that means is it's well we we're, we we're under law i mean we got to put ourselves under law to not live unto ourselves and that's not what the text is saying stop and think a minute about what it must mean to not live unto ourselves under grace okay But unto him which died for them and rose again. There's there's a there's there's a, a matter of resurrection here that that is, that is related to the Christian walk. His resurrection is absolutely completely related to our Christian walk. Why? Because it's not I but Christ. It's Christ manifest. It's it's walking in the Spirit. Walking by faith, not by sight. Walking in the Spirit, not the flesh. We don't live according to the flesh. We live according to the Spirit. He made us alive. He raised us with Him when He died. We walk in newness of life. He is life. We don't walk in a way that we're, in which we're trying to please God because He's totally been propitiated through this, the work of Christ on our behalf. We walk worthy of our calling wherewith we were called. And we live as who we are. We live as the saints in which we are. Why? Because there, if any man be in Christ, this is verse 17, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And that is such a common verse. It is on the heart and the mind of almost every believer I've ever met. And yet very few really understand the import of those words. You are a, if you're a believer in Christ, you have been made, made. You didn't make yourself. You were made a new creation in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. And it, and it took place a long time before you ever had a, a, a head for a thought to pass through. You, were made, you weren't made a new creation in Christ Jesus when you uh, suddenly decided one day that you were going to, you know... Uh, satisfy a, um, a God who was sitting up there anxiously waiting for your decision to do something, you know, to accept Christ, and then you were made a new creation in Christ Jesus. If you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, all old things have passed away. All things have become new. Why? Why? Why has all old things passed away and all things become new? Because your entire existence as a Christian, your entire life, your entire message, your entire ministry, every molecule, every atom, every particle of you, every bit of you is spiritual. You have a physical body here now that will be dissolved. 
your your walk, your message. We've seen in previous verses our our message, our walk, our ministry is it can it can be dissolved. This body, this temporal body, it's it's the God is concerned about what we do with it, how we live in it, and that is not law. That's not well, you know. God doesn't want you eating bacon, and God doesn't want you drinking strawberry milkshakes, and, and God doesn't want you dancing on Friday or shooting pool on Saturday. That is not what that's talking about at all. We are not under law, but we're under grace. In fact, we've died to the law in order that we might bear fruit unto God. If we have not died to law, to the law, and it's, it's not really, you don't see the definite article there. If we haven't died to law, that's any principle, any standard whereby righteousness is achieved on a human level. If we haven't died to the law, Scripture says every Christian has, but if we haven't died to the law, we cannot bear fruit unto God. We can't do it. We can't do it. Because we, we're, we, the branches, are making ourselves out to be the vine. We're assuming that we are the vine, that which produces whatever. Folks, we don't produce anything. The Holy Spirit does. It is the fruit of the Spirit. It doesn't say, the text doesn't say it's the fruit of the believer by the Spirit. It, it, it's the fruit of the Spirit. And if one characteristic is there, they'll all be there. If one characteristic that's listed there in of the fruit of the Spirit, if it's not there, if one's not is missing, it's not there, none are there. Well, Steve, I just want patience. I need patience. Just God give me I got all the rest of the stuff. I just need patience. I, I'm missing that one thing, and God that's not how it works. Folks, that's not how God doesn't he doesn't divvy out, you know, this stuff by piecemeal, okay? I mean, it's the fruit of the Spirit as a whole. And we're to walk in the Spirit, not the flesh. Now, Christ is ma Christ manifests. I believe that's another entire issue. It would take probably a couple of videos to even talk about it because it's not the fruit of the Spirit. Christ living in and through me, um, Christ himself manifests, I, we we actually have scripture that says Christ is himself is manifest through us or can be but the fruit of the spirit is is God's growth in our life it's the result of God's growth in our life one one plants one waters but God causes the growth and I don't know how many Christians I know who think they cause the growth We're a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God. They're of God. All things are of God. You didn't con you didn't concoct anything on your own. You didn't make any decision uh, on your own. You didn't you didn't determine anything on your own. You didn't conclude anything on your own. You didn't design, create, establish anything on your own. All things are of God. And this is in the context of ministry. Ministry. Oh, I'm just going to get out there and I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to labor heavily. And, uh, boy, I hope God's pleased with me if I do. Wrong attitude. Wrong mindset. Okay. If you're not, if whatever you do, you're not doing it because you love him and you love his people, don't do it. You're just wasting your time. All things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. The same reconciliation God gave us that as a, as, that is our ministry or a big aspect of it. Reconciliation. The text goes on. It's even it's even more amazing how it goes on that he was in, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses against them. 
Did you know that you live in an age in which God is not even imputing men's trespasses against them? Did you know that? And hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. And I've pointed out in the past, an ambassador doesn't speak of himself. He's not there to represent himself. But Christ. As though God did beseech, the word is beg. As though God did beg you by us, says Paul. We pray you, in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. Come to realize in your own experience that what is true of you, that you've been reconciled to God, is manifest in your experience. For he has made him to be sin for us. Folks, the sin issue has been forever settled. Forever. Who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Romans says we have been. That's where we live, stand, walk. That's, that's, that's our talk. That's our, that's our life. That's our message. That's our ministry. But we'll never persuade others unless we have that deep reverence for God, which the context bears out we should have. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.